<clears throat> okay, so I guess you can find the uh, tool over here uh, if you want to start playing around with it, but um, otherwise, yeah, this is uh, Coda or and the uh, Coda dependency analysis toolkit. So, and feel free to ask questions at any time because I feel like uh, if I'm explaining something not deeply enough or you want to know something more than ask away because probably there's at least one other person who's thinking about the same question so go ahead uh, I won't be able to look at the chat but uh, I guess pressure can keep an eye on it and uh, ask me if uh, if there's any questions over there yeah yep I'll do that so I guess the one of the questions is why did I write this tool in the first place? There were quite a few reasons. So one of was just to understand like how this some arbitrary program was like put together and like how to understand like dependencies and how they function or and like how they are related to each other. I needed to reduce binary sizes at some point. So there were, yeah, I needed to understand where does the mass of the code base come from? And like, what can I easily remove or replace? I needed to visualize them, of course. And uh, the one question you might get is why not go list or go mode? Right? They are excellent tools. However, they give you kind of this static output that's exactly what's what your repository looks like, but you cannot kind of remove information that you will want to need or kind of join information together from multiple sources. And so it makes some things more difficult. And uh, how it started was more of a bunch of tiny tools. So I had this uh, way of making algebraic op operations on package sets. I'll come back to that, what it means later, but uh, there was a tool to visualize dependencies as a tree and uh, calculate cost of erasing packages and kind of analyze compilation input output and kind of a few more. So I eventually kind of converged them into this toolkit, which is Coda. And roughly what the initial one of the implementations looked like is that uh, you get a kind of set of packages, which is just uh, like the package ID. You can think of it just as the package ID and its dependencies, and then you remove or add things to it. So, and I guess now we, if you can kind of understand this screen shot roughly, then you kind of will understand the whole uh, tool set better, but I'll go into kind of more how you will end up using the tool rather than the implementations. <coughs> so uh, I made this uh, tiny kind of mock project that has a bunch of different dependencies and kind of here it's really difficult to understand like what's actually going on. So, uh, so here let's I have this alpha test, which is the module, and it has kind of this client command, server command that has dependencies to RPC and service, and server has dependencies on database and service. And there's a bunch of uh, um, things here. Uh, usually, this is like really hard to understand what's actually happening. And that's where the Coda tool comes in. Uh, the most basic way you can use it is you say go to graph and you say which packages you want to visualize. It will pull in all the dependencies and uh, packages that follow the path specification. So kind of dot slash dot 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 means everything in my current folder. And for the following demos, you can assume that there's a, this 
.dsvg to pipe it into graphviz and kind of give this nicer output. Um, so graph outputs the graphviz um, uh, format the, the die graph. Um, uh, but there are other options there. So now that you have this uh, output, you might uh, see that there's a few colors there. Um, the coloring is mainly to make it very obvious like where the dependencies come from. So if you're looking at the alpha test database, you can easily kind of trace back the same color to where the dependencies come from. So it helps to distinguish these uh, a little bit better. And so we can go forward. Uh, you can kind of specify, of course, kind of uh, sub packages and so on. Um, and one of the things you might be wondering now is like, where are the standard packages? They are usually somewhere, right? Um, and uh, one of the exec executive decisions I made was that uh, standard packages are removed by default. Uh, otherwise, the output would look like this. Uh, so sometimes you still need to access the standard packages. So that means you need to add the dash standard flag to keep them, to, to not remove them. Um, but usually kind of working with uh, the standard packages, like, uh, they are just so interwoven and there are so many of them that you cannot really uh, get a good grasp on what you're actually working with. What's that one at the bottom? The one um, on, the, on the far right with everything going to it? I'm not sure. Uh, might be some... I cannot zoom right now. <laughs> um, I, it doesn't yeah. matter. I'm just interested. Yeah, we can take a look later. I currently didn't want to do the live demo thing because it's kind of switching between browsers and so it's kind of uh, disruptive. Okay, so let's say you're kind of looking at this graph and you want to remove this RPC package from the output. What you can do is you write it as a uh, basic algebraic operation. So you say, oh, give me all the packages and then subtract out the alpha test slash RPC and all of its dependencies. Right. I have a short question regarding uh, the sizes yes. of the packages. You have uh, some sizes like uh, 6 slash 99 bytes. Mm -hmm. What uh, does the 6 in front of a size mean? Uh, I think in the, by default that's the number of lines. Okay. But you can customize that as well. Uh, that comes later. So there's a bunch of stats you can actually visualize. Uh, but yeah, so you can subtract out different packages if you don't want to see that. So often you might see that, oh, there's golang.org slash x slash something, right? Uh, you're, you know that you need to use them so like you can remove them from the graph output and kind of just understand it slightly better by removing. Yeah. Then you can intersect information. So let's say you want to know what are the packages that the server and the migration tool here both use. Like what's the common things that they use? So you. You say that, oh, there's a function intersect and you kind of intersect their dependencies. So in the end, so one of them selects this blue thing, the other selects this red thing, and then you can get what's in both of them. Okay. Um, yeah. Then you might um, now. Sometimes you might want to, uh, okay, I'll speak about the package selectors. One of the problems with always selecting the full dependency chain is that you might actually not want the whole packages, but you want specifically one package only 
or the things that you specified. So in this case, let's say I want to only grab packages that exactly match this uh, path specification. Um, then you have this uh, kind of colon root, which means that uh, everything that's not there dependencies, right? So that way, kind of this uh, external dependency here, which is another package, like that won't be included. So let's say if you're visualizing your own project only without external dependencies, then this is one of the good ways to start. Of course, um, you can also do it the other ways. You can say, oh, give me the sources of this uh, graph. The sources are the things that don't have any dependencies. So effectively, this will end up giving you like the top level entry points to your project. Of course, you also have negations for both the root and the source. So you can say, oh, just remove the first layer because often what you have is, let's say the main package ends up importing everything from your project, right? So you like, I don't really care about that and I can kind of uh, split it up a bit more if I remove it. Um, some of these selectors do kind of can be uh, aggregated. So you can kind of set uh, the no source multiple times so you can kind of go deeper into the um, layers. Um, that doesn't work for root because the root means about uh, specific packages that you were importing. Um, Sorry, what's no, what does no source do again? So that's the, so these two are equivalent. So it removes the sources. So it's kind of select all packages minus the source, uh, meaning the first the nodes that don't have any de uh, incoming dependencies and the no source does the same thing. So it kind of everything except those nodes that have the, don't have those so so what would be what would be the equivalent of of uh doing colon no source twice in if in just in terms of source uh it means uh so meaning in this uh, uh, directed acyclic craft you remove the first layer so the first two things here so you can kind of start peeling away the layers of the projects and kind of them and kind of so um, yeah. So it's more of uh, actually I never have to use this in practice, but uh, I can imagine that uh, uh, in larger projects it might be useful. Maybe. Um, so we can take a look at a few other approaches. So one is this uh, no root thing, which means that everything, so kind of select the, all the packages in the project and remove the root, which is the dot slash dot dot dot, my, uh, things that exactly match, right? So it, means effectively give me all the dependencies without the thing that I explicitly specified. Right. And of course you can kind of start combining them like here you can say, oh, give me the command entry point uh, dependencies, right? which effectively selects your dependencies, but without uh, command instruments. Make sense? Can you can you put a colon operator on, on an expression? So could you say, you know, some expression and then say no roots on that? Uh, you cannot use root on an uh, kind of uh, on a expression like that because 
root means that you kind of explicitly specify a particular package set. So this is the kind of the query here. So it doesn't make sense to use it on an expression because there, it doesn't, doesn't have a good meaning there. However, you can use source and no source on it because you do have the, still the top level of the, uh, the graph that you can remove or kind of so you could put so you can have a colon colon source after a, after a, you know a, a, an expression in parentheses or something yes yeah okay interesting thanks um and i guess so of course you can kind of combine them in different ways uh, So this is kind of uh, saying that give me all the packages, all the dependencies for the binaries of the project, but remove all the dep external dependencies of the project. Because this is saying that uh, give me all the kind of dependencies for the uh, binaries and it removes all the external dependencies. There. Okay. Um, okay. So now, of course, you sometimes want to do more complicated than just remove layers. Um, you want to do some very specific operation. For example, you may want to know how does this, uh, my binaries relate to the database. So what you can do is say, how can this command reach this database? Okay. So one of the things you might be notice here that the database has this colon root at the end. It's important there because otherwise it will see all, it will find any path to also the database dependencies. So for example, if the database has a dependency for a thumb package, then it would effectively display the whole dependency change because most of the packages have a dependency on thumb. Right? You want to find the path to a concrete package. So this uh, database root. Does that make sense? Hmm? Pre presumably in practice, you'd need to add quotes around that reach thing or no, because otherwise, because no. otherwise the brackets will be special to the shell, right? No. I mean, because. Right. Uh, so uh, I suspect it might depend on the shell. Um, uh, I've tried really hard to make the most of the syntax work without any need for escaping or kind of quotes. So, uh, so, so basically it concatenates all the arguments with spaces. And yes. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suspect there are shells or cases where it might kind of interpret this as a, like a shell invocation or something, but uh, I have a, uh, I've made modifications to the expression language to make to fix these things, but uh, so I suspect there are. So certainly in Bash, uh, round quote is you know if you echo something with a round bracket in it, it it's a syntax error. Is it really? Hmm. Okay, maybe. So square brackets, square brackets are okay. Right, round brackets are, are generally not. <laughs> but. Uh... Well, yeah, basically, you sometimes need to quote things for your shell. Um, unfortunately, I cannot do much about it. Uh, um, but yeah, of course, you can use uh, any expression in either of these as well. So you might say, oh, how does this command package reach database plus some other package? as well. Um, yeah. The, one of the requests I got was to 
to give out the transitive reduction of the graph, which effectively means that uh, what's the graph in which order you can compile it. Like that's the easiest way to think about it. Uh, so like I need to compile these three packages in the, the not the last layer, but the one before it, before I can compile this alpha test service, right? And I need to compile this alpha test service before I can compile command client. So, but one of the things it gives you is this uh, nice view of the uh, dependency hierarchy. So you don't necessarily know which packages exactly import each other. However, you know that if uh, that depends on that package and it depends on those below it, then it, there's some way, some dependency in those. So why is this useful is if we take this uh, standard package um, example and we do the transitive reduction here, you get this uh, graph. So you can get a much clearer view of the, like how different things are, or the, a simpler view uh, that can help you figure out things. <laughs> and finally, there's this uh, incoming uh, uh, function, which selects every, every node that comes into a specific package or a package expression. So you can kind of find out what are the things that directly import this alpha test slash RPC? Um, why these might be useful is, uh, uh, so let's say a good example of reach is, uh, show me how C is used in my project. You know, there's some C dependency, but you don't know where. Uh, then you can also look at something like, how is reflect being in, used in my project? Like, how does it end up in my pro, in my program? And maybe I can remove it. Um, you can also try kind of reaching this unsafe. However, since pretty much everything depends on unsafe in the standard library, it gives you this mess of a picture. Um, so. The next step is kind of trying to make it simpler to consume. Uh, so what you need in the unsafe case, you would now need to remove all the standard packages except unsafe, right? So give me all the packet, how to reach unsafe and remove all the standard packages that's, that aren't unsafe. Yeah. And then I can see like, oh, these two things use unsafe. So maybe I can fix that. And uh, this is kind of the way you kind of start adding or removing and adjusting these different uh, expressions to like figure out things for yourself. And you can, of course, uh, Let's say you also want to kind of remove reflect and so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, any questions? Okay. The next thing you might want to now start doing is maybe you want to kind of set those environment variables. Uh, so let's say you have a crash on Linux, but not on Windows in your program. So you might want to look at what are the different packages that uh, they import. So maybe one ends up importing some broken package and you can kind of uh, figure that out. 
So in this case, we're doing the XOR, like to see the differences between the packages being imported. And uh, so this go uh, equals windows means that uh, set this environment variable for, for this uh, sub expression. Um, um, you can also set uh, regular uh, tags this way. So maybe you want to see what's the difference between pure Go and, and uh, non-pure Go. Uh, or you may want to look at uh, like what are the differences between the test version or the uh, test packages and the non-test packages. Um, so this test is a special kind of environment uh, tag that I'm using to indicate whether the dependency graph should include the tests as well. By default, they are not included because most of the time you don't need them. Is there a way of getting the test thing to apply to the dependencies of dot, dot, dot as well as the, as well as the, um, like the, the direct things? I was having this issue today. At the moment, I don't think so. Um, because I'm not sure whether the tools, uh, Golang tools uh, loader can handle it that way. Like it would need to make a bunch of extra queries to find out the tests and kind of test it out. So yeah, because 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 I was wondering which you know oh can I delete this package? But it's important to include all the tests in that. But it does mean you can get cycles in the graph. Well, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's more basically most of the expressions you can use there and uh, yeah and of course there's multiple ways to visualize that information i've been showing the graph output because that's usually what you go do when you're kind of exploring things uh, they are kind of neat way to see things however there's also the list which kind of gives you just a listing of things so if you're looking at packages that directly import the C, list might be a nicer way to visualize it because you don't really need the graph. Um, you of course have the tree structure. So let's say if you're working in a, a command line environment and you cannot kind of easily show the graph somewhere, then like the tree is the next best thing. You do see the tilde here, which says that all oh, this uh, package dependencies have been already uh, like shown in the tree structure. This is to make the output smaller. Then, of course, a graph, which you already saw. However, there are actually multiple output formats. One is uh, one really useful one is GraphML, which you can open up in plenty of uh, graph editing tools, such as uh, YEd and um, yeah. And there are simpler formats, for example, edges or type graph that you can pipe into crap and kind of search for different lines. Um, but yeah, most of the time I'm using dot and really rarely GraphML. So um, the main reason to use GraphML is because some of the uh, graph editing tools have more powerful ways of visualizing tech graphs. So and manipulating them. And as I said in the in the beginning, there's a way to also change what's being displayed. So if you uh, specify this dash f uh, for formatting the uh, information, 
uh, then you can see like all the information that's being this that's available. Um, I've been I kind of redacted some of it and tried to make it prettier, um, but there's quite a lot of information. Uh, I guess there's uh, the stepped things, which is uh, effectively the statistics about this specific package. Uh, for example, you might want to like print out how many go lines there are, or how la how large the binary files are there. You can also check for how many tokens there are or declarations. And um, when you uh, say the binary files, what 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 files are you referring to there? Uh, let's say you have a font file in the package. Right. Uh, what, like oh yeah, just just files inside that package directory that that look like binary files. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so effectively, there's the way how it. Uh, so usually the Go binaries don't actually like this. Usually stays zero, but for consistency, it's kind of the same way as the other files is handled. Um, and then you also have the statistics for the upstream and downstream. So upstream meaning all the packages that import this package and downstream all the packages uh, that it imports, either directly or indirectly. So you can kind of, let's, um, you can, basically get statistics on how many lines of code does this piece of package depend on, right? Or how many lines, how many packages need that specific uh, uh, package. Um, you can, of course, there are a few functions to format the output. So one of the things we added with uh, Roger was this uh, rel, which says that, oh, output this dot .id relative to this path. So if you're kind of working on your project, which starts usually with github.com, my organization slash my project, and you really, that doesn't help you with visualization and you want to remove it. So that's a quick way to remove it. There's another one uh, called uh, re rename uh, that allows you to replace it with anything, some other name as well. Uh, but in case you want to replace multiple, then you might need to distinguish between two different uh, packages. Um, and so, like, you can, of course, do different formatting for um, dot. So, let's say you want to. Uh, output like how many packages need it. So you kind of you take the upstream package count and you get uh, uh, yeah you can display it in your graph as needed. Well, why why doesn't why doesn't the upstream count correspond to the incoming arrows? Uh, because it's all the upstream. So one, two, three, kind of. So if you look at RPC, it's needed by service and client. And it also is needed indirectly by server. Gotcha. So, so it's direct or indirect uh, uh, upstream and downstream. And of course, you can do computations, um, like the ratio of all files size divided by the like the downstream file size. Uh, that's not particularly useful, but I guess uh, I I wasn't able to come up with a really good example here. <laughs> but you might need it to, to kind of understand uh, some calculate things. Yeah. And yeah, that's mostly about the expression and the formatting.
Any questions about this? No? Okay, now we switch gears and come to an, a different tool, which is Coda Cut, which basically means I want to cut out some packages for my projects. And what are the easiest uh, packages to cut and how much benefit do I gain from, or how much code will I remove if I remove that package? So, <clears throat> and uh, if you give your project, it will say that, oh, these packages have, let's say it has one incoming package. And if I remove this package, it also removes uh, one other package along with it. Um, this kind of uh, facilitated example probably isn't uh, like as great, but we'll take a look at the uh, real project later to see what we discovered. Um, and you also see how many lines of code it would end up removing. So, uh, or the other way to interpret this is like, to remove RPC, I need to replace it in two other packages, and it ends up removing this many, this much code. Um, I have another question regarding the sizes. Um, yeah. Are the sizes measured on based on the file sizes in Go code, or is there any kind of approximation how big <laughs> the size is go uh, the package size is going to be in binary format? Um, these are the Go source sizes at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, I okay. do kind of have a rough idea how to get approximate estimates for the packages, actual binary sizes as well, but that's, I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, but the count of declarations or tokens is a really good approximation for the size of the package in the binary, right? So if you kind of combine the binary, uh, the, or if you use the token count or the declaration count, you will kind of roughly approximate it anyways. Is the, are the results ordered at all? Uh, what? Can you repeat? Are, the, are those results ordered at all by, you know, like... Uh, by yes. Like... Yeah, so they are ordered by the like the effort required to replace them and the impact they have. Uh, I think there were a few other... So, um, okay, maybe they, there weren't any way to differently sort them, but yeah. Might be a future addition to sort them differently. Does it, take um, into account, does it take into account tests as well? Uh, you need to include the need test. To test equals one, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so speaking of the binary size, I do have this Coda weight, um, which is kind of trying to analyze the binary size. I haven't yet combined it with the other tools. However, you can get this uh, statistics uh, on the binaries uh, size or the packages themselves in the binaries. Um, in this case, the, it shows the symbols in the, inside the binary and there's the, like the, how much the package, so if you look at the second column is how much that specific thing, uh, uh, how much binary space it takes and the left, uh, the number on the left side is the uh, everything, including the sub packages, right? So in this case, it also includes the graph and graph ML stats in this the left thing, because it's usually the there's a kind of package and sub package relation somehow uh, involved. So this is useful, can be useful information. You can also kind of specify like how large uh, uh, symbols you care about and uh, you can, here you can sort them differently as well. So 
So I don't, so, so weight, weight is showing you, uh, so minimum is showing you the minimum. Uh, the, so yeah, so the minimum says that uh, by default it's at one K, which means that uh, don't show me symbols that are less than one kilobytes large, because there's a ton of them. So it kind of excludes them. In this case, I needed to include them to show the graph and graph ML relation. Um, but you can kind of uh, set it higher to find like the more important things first and uh, adjust it as you need it. Nice. Yeah. But the, like the small ones are still included in the total, so you can you know, roughly see that something is there. Yeah. Then there's code.exec, which is about analy analyzing uh, compilation. Uh, so if you pass it as a tool exec to go build, then you get the uh, binaries coming into the compiler and the uh, binar binaries going out of the compiler. So this is, could be a good way to figure out like, oh, this compilation is taking me 300 milliseconds. I need to improve it, right? Um, but you can also see which of the packages are actually kind of re really large to compile. So you might uh, end up finding things to, like things that could be smaller. Yep. So different things that currently are missing is like, I don't have a nice way to integrate this uh, graph system to work together with modules, because when you bring modules into the picture, you may want to see part of the information with modules and part of it as packages and kind of mix and match those two. So I'm still working that thing out. And of course, versions, um, I think partially you should be able to kind of also kind of subtract between two different versions. However, you don't get the like difference, uh, the versions or different versions in the output, which is, I don't really know how to solve it, but it would be cool if it was solved, I guess. Graph collapsing. So let's say you have internal packages you want to uh, kind of hide, uh, especially from uh, third party implementations, because you don't really care what their internal thing does sometimes. So it would be nice to collapse them into a single node. Of course, better documentation and uh, kind of improve weight exec to combine into the, all the other tools. Yeah. And of course, yeah, the weight exec tools are kind of, uh, I guess, the least polished state uh, with regards to understandability. And, uh, but yeah, and I was thinking that it might be interesting to just look at the real project. Uh, and I picked out the package.co site. Uh, because yeah, why not? I haven't uh, explored it much. Uh, so, so first of the things you might want to do with your new project is you just kind of take a look at everything, right? Um, this is taking some time. Um, One suggestion for a for a feature might be a way to just integrate the dot call into that. I've got a little um, script there called go to view, which does that, but yeah. Um, so one of could be, yeah. Yeah. I think that should be fine. Um, I've been, uh, thinking of writing my own graph layouting, so I don't have to kind of work with graphics as well, but uh, that's uh, a long way around. So now that we are looking at this package site, um, like the initial output from all the dependencies isn't really useful, right? 
Um, and this is how the big projects get. Uh, you import gRPC and like the whole graph already looks like that. <laughs> so um, that's actually pretty good. I mean, you know, that's pretty pretty <laughs> pretty good compared to most most projects. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this isn't uh, like trying to say I'm not trying to say anything bad about it. this. This is just like how big projects get. Uh, that's just uh, unfortunate thing. Uh, so one thing, or the other thing you might want to try then, if that was too big, is to just look at the internal package structure. Uh, so if I refresh it, like this already looks more manageable. However, the first thing I notice here is like I have these few top-level commands here, right? They kind of one of the things that they do is that they pull everything together, and it's hard to really see like what's going on here. So there are two things that I could do it. One, I could say, oh, uh, don't give me the sources um, of the graph. Um, so then I get like this thing, like already a slightly better graph, but maybe uh, not as um, not what I wanted. Uh, so because there's still this command internal thing. So the other thing I I want to try here is I'll let's say instead of removing the source, I'll remove all the binaries from the or the oh you said the hood here. I'll remove all the binary imports from the command package and see whether maybe that gives me a slightly better output. So currently, um, I mean, I think it looks fine from this left side of the graph. Um, oh, one thing you can do in these graphs is you can click on packages and it will go to the appropriate documentation page. So, um, and the other thing I notice here that, that is- presumably it's going to work for private projects, right? Uh, you can actually, there was, I think there was this, um, uh, without your help. There's this docs string where you can specify your own URL if you want to. Oh, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> but now I see like um, one of the things with problems with this graph is that I see this D errors package that's used everywhere. Right. So it's kind of collapsing the graph into a single, like this single mess. And it would be nice to kind of remove it. So I'll just, uh, oops, um, didn't mean to. So it would be nice if this selection worked. Oh, well, I'll just type it up. Um, so I'll do. Package site internal features. Uh, let's room, remove that uh, from the output. Well, and now this is kind of already slightly more manageable. Like, there are a few things that are as well. Um, like I see this. Um, like internal standard library being used quite often as well. So this thing here. So maybe I want to also remove that. Um, but this time I'll also remove its uh, dependencies, this internal version uh, and this test helper. Mm. But yeah, one thing you but you need to kind of pay attention is like what exactly are, are you, you end up removing. Oh, and there seems to also be this logging package that's heavily used. So let's remove that as well. No. Have you considered making root? the default and like having a colon depth qualifier <coughs> instead? I have. 
And the issue roughly is that the non-root Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. It's one of those things that you're kind of mixing them both at equal rates, roughly. And uh, if you're kind of working on smaller projects, you end up not using root as much and the, like the other way around. So for maybe yeah. from an intuition point of view, the, the root yeah. thing is more, it's like exactly what the go path was specified, and then you can expand that from there, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, th that might make sense. Uh, I haven't yet reached version one, so I can still change things. <laughs> um, and yeah, let's do a refresh. And now, yeah. And this is something I would kind of start maybe looking more deeply into maybe remove some of these internal front ends as so, well. Yeah. Um, front and, and the other was worker. Do you need a brackets around those two or something? Oh, yeah. I need a minus here. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so, and that's like roughly how the usage ends up being. Like you remove things, you kind of try to intersect and maybe uh, depending on what you need, you kind of then uh, combine it with other information and form add some different labels. Um, one thing would be nice to look at is this color cut. Let's see what it tells us. Uh, yeah. So here we have a lot more information. So, As you can see that there's this, uh, oh, there's Git. There's only one package using it. However, if we did replace it, it would remove 40 packages and one megabyte of source code from it. Is there any way to remove main packages? Um, remove main packages, what do you mean? Like, like, could you could you get because because sometimes if you're cutting, you like okay, I definitely don't want to remove any main packages. Mm. I, I just ran it on. I just ran the cut thing on 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 our own repo, and I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I can see those. Oh, but I'm pretty sure those are main uh, packages. So I, I don't want to remove those. think if you do this, if you do the no source thing, you strip away the first layer of the. Uh, graph, then it will end up uh, showing it. However, okay, the issue is strip out the ones yeah. that I really want to be able to remove. Yeah, it will kind of also. It won't there show those. Some sources, oh. There's some sources which you know. Like they're, they're... Uh, oh, I know what you. Maybe you can do uh, something like. So let's take this. And I think what was the, how there was, a, I think there's some, like something like this. Um, I'm just wondering, not, um, um, Like there was, um, oh yeah, so if you do this, should show the main packages. No, nope. Hmm. 
Well, there might be a way to expose that as a Boolean and then you can kind of prep it out. Uh, so. I, 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 yeah, get I, get, I get I I get yeah, there's there's probably probably a way. Yeah. So. Um but yeah. I think that's um it. <laughs>